Welcome to the FaithBridge Sermon Podcast. Be sure to keep watching immediately after the sermon for Postscript, a weekly podcast with in-depth content and answers to your questions submitted during the sermon. You can also find it on iTunes or at faithbridge.org slash postscript. Open Gates is a special needs ministry here at the church. Um, we want to uh, love on kids for for Christ and um, encourage them in their walks with Him. Um, it's important because these families, out of all families, they need to be encouraged and they need to have community. It shouldn't be because of their child's disability they can't participate in a church. That shouldn't be the case. We should be the place, out of all places, that says, yes, we want you here. You're welcome here. I'm Lauren Perkins. And I'm David Perkins. We've been going to Faith Bridge since this summer. Our family, we have uh, four and a half year old sex tuplets, three boys and three girls one of which has special needs. They just moved to the area and wanted to sign the kids up for our VBS. I signed up the five kids, and then when they called to make sure, I really had five kids born on the same day. (laughs) And I said, "Um, I do, and I have a sixth one, but she has special needs, so I didn't sign her up. One of our staff members got in touch with me, and I ended up calling her and saying, hey, we have a place for Leah. We want her here. We want her to come to VBS just along with her siblings and be in their same little group and participate in activities. And that's when Rhonda came into the picture, and she was a new shadow at the time. A shadow is an Open Gates volunteer designated for one child. Courtney told me all about her and she said, I think you're gonna be a perfect match. So I was a little nervous, not knowing what to expect. That was my first encounter with the Perkins. And that was when I met Leah, who I shadow every Sunday now. And I fell in love with her the first evening that I met her. Little Leah has um, bonded so much with with Rhonda, and um, the whole Perkins family adores her. If anything she knows that's going on with Leah, doctor's appointments or any decisions we're making, she'll text me, just let me know she's been praying for her and what's what's going on. She wants an update. She's not only taking Leah under her wing, it's all the kids. It's all six of them together. She gets them involved in reading stories. If she's reading to Leah, she'll get everybody around her to read with her too. Rhonda is what made us decide to commit to going to Faith Bridge. When she said that um, she's gotten really connected to Leah and she has a relationship with Leah that she wants to, you know, keep pursuing and strengthening. That was what made us said, Faith Bridge is, is our home and Rhonda was what made us finally decide to commit to Faith Bridge. We want parents to be able to go to service worry-free. We just want them to be able to focus and be filled. We don't want them to be concerned that their child is being neglected. We want them to know that they are being cared for and they are being loved and they are being included. That is what we're all about. Inclusion, inclusion, inclusion. And as much as possible, as often as possible, we want them to be included with their with their peers. When we walk in, it volunteers and the staff all, you know, say hi to them and know their names and give them hugs. Inclusion is not just a thing that just kids ministry does. Our church as a whole has a heart for inclusion. We have the privilege of telling people of all abilities how deeply they are loved by God. Yeah, isn't that awesome? I get touched every time I see that piece. And uh, I just love our Open Gates ministry, and I want to invite you to consider being a part of it. That is the video said in either one of two ways. Uh, You could be a part, if you didn't know we have that, and you have a child or a loved one with special needs of any age, or you know somebody who does, you tell them Faith Bridge is a place for you. And why don't you come to that Come and See on January 15th. Get registered for that, faithbridge.org slash uh, January 15th. And, but I just have a suspicion that 
several of you are feeling a nudging of the Holy Spirit even now, saying, you know, I think maybe I should be a shadow. That might be a way that I could serve God. I was talking to a mother of uh, one with special needs who said, you know, the interesting thing about having a, a, a kiddo with special needs is that it's like you sign up to go on a mission trip that you never get to come, go home from uh, because it doesn't end. And at Faithbridge, we really want to be a place where at least for you know, an hour and 15 or 30 minutes, uh, moms and dads can let go and come in here and worship and experience God and just know that their little one or not so little one is being well taken care of and uh, shown the love of God in a way that he or she can, can feel and understand. That's not just on the Klein campus. That's at the Woodlands campus as well. And speaking of, good morning, welcome, happy new year. In all of our rooms at Klein at the Woodlands, we're so glad that you're here. If you're online, welcome online uh, as well. Glad that you are here um, at FaithBridge as we ring in the new year. So uh, any number of you have asked, how did that, that gap fund end up? up. Um, you know, we gave to it, we've prayed about it, blah, 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 and you're going to give us a little update. Well, yes and no. I'm going to give you an update uh, now to tell you this. I don't know how it has come out. You say, well, how can you not know? Well, because there was a stack of mail that came in yesterday that they're going through, and then there's still mail that will come tomorrow or Tuesday, postmarked yesterday, which is the IRS deadline. And so I can't make an announcement yet, but I can tell you this much. The turnaround from that red arrow that was pointing down in that little graph that we showed you a month ago when I came out and just kind of poured my heart out, and um, that has turned around in the most remarkable way that I think maybe I've seen in 18 years of ministry and has bolstered my faith and just, I just want to say thank you. Uh, and to many of you who said, you know what, I've never given here. I just really never thought about it until that day that you mentioned it. And so you stepped in and I just want to say thank you so, so much. I'm going to make a full announcement next week before I start the series also next week, um, and uh, so be sure and be here for that, and we'll see you next week. Today is a special treat. It's always a fun treat when Duffy Robbins is here, and he brings in the new year uh, for us today with a very good word. Let's welcome Duffy in all our rooms right now as he comes to preach. Happy thank you. Thank you. Hey, good morning. Happy New Year. Good to see everybody. Welcome. Glad you're here. Thanks again for, for joining us. Uh, and again, as Pastor Ken said, those of you who are here uh, on the Klein campus, but also those of you in the Woodlands, and if you're joining us live stream online, always a pleasure to have you uh, worship with us as well. I hope everybody had a, had a great, great Christmas and uh, you've enjoyed this holiday week. It's been a little bit weird uh, in the Robbins family because we... Um, we, just, we did a little bit differently this year, Christmas and Christmas Eve. I think most of you know, you've heard me talk about the fact that I have two daughters, and uh, both of whom are married. And uh, this year, um, both girls spent Christmas Eve and Christmas with their uh, husband's families. So, uh, so this year, Christmas Eve, Christmas, it was just me and, and Maggie. And, um, and uh, it, it's, let me, just out of curiosity, how many of you are actually uh, empty nesters? Let's see a show of hands. Okay, and all right, let me ask you this. How many of you empty nesters were in the empty nest on Christmas Eve and Christmas morning? Let's see. Okay, yeah, yeah, the ones that look relaxed, uh, well-rested, yeah. You know, it's funny, it sounds weird, but um, I think when it really, the strangest part of the whole deal uh, was Christmas Eve night, because we have this tradition in the Robbins family where, uh, we've been doing this for years, where we invite our, our girls uh, and their husbands and their children uh, to do this kind of once a year big splurge dinner where we invite everybody to be our guests at Ruth's Chris Steakhouse. 
And, uh, and yeah, I mean, it's just sick. And, and, uh, and it's been uh, very, very fun, but it's also, uh, it's pretty pricey. Um, anyway, this year it was totally different. And uh, I can still remember Christmas Eve night, uh, Maggie and I just sitting there, the two of us at the table sort of staring at each other, thinking about how much money we were saving. <laughs> and uh, and um, yeah, it really kind of put us in a festive mood for the Christmas Eve service. Uh, one of the happiest Christmases in years. But uh, no, it, it, <laughs> we might actually have a new tradition. But, but uh, if you're visiting with us this morning uh, here at Faith Bridge, or you're a regular part of our uh, family, uh, we've gathered on this New Year's Day uh, because we want to celebrate the good news that, uh, that the Christ uh, of, the, of the Christmas Day Advent wants also to be the Christ of our uh, everyday New Year uh, adventure. So we're, we're glad you're here. I think for most of us, um, one of the uh, reasons that New Year's Day is a little bit uh, special is that it sort of offers us a chance to think about, you know, what's coming next? What, what's, what's, what's next? I mean, here we are on the threshold of a new year. Uh, I think it's just natural that we'd sort of wonder about what, you know, what's going to come uh, over the course of the next 365 days of life. You know, will, this, will there be changes at work? Will I, uh, you know, get a new car? Will our, you know, water heater crash? You know, uh, you know will I lose weight? And will I uh, pass calculus? Uh, and, and how might my social life change if I don't pass calculus? And, and, uh, and uh, will, will this be the year we get a, a phone call from Chip and Joanna Gaines in, in wanting to remodel our home? Uh, and, uh, and, and I want us uh, on this New Year's morning to, to read a brief passage from God's Word that points us directly to this question, what comes next? So um, if you have a Bible, I want to invite you to turn to the book of Revelation. Uh, chapter 4. If you don't have a Bible, put your hand in the air. We'd love to uh, uh, make one available to you, these good folks. And so just put your hand up. The book of Revelation is at the very back of the book. And uh, we're in chapter 4 of the book of Revelation. We're going to begin reading in verse 1. Chapter 4, verse 1, the book of Revelation. After this, I looked and behold, a door standing open in heaven. And the first voice, which I had heard speaking to me like a trumpet said, come up here and I will show you what must take place after this. At once I was in the spirit and behold, a throne stood in heaven with one seated on the throne. And around the throne on each side of the throne are four living creatures full of eyes in front and behind. The first living creature like a lion. The second living creature like an ox. The third living creature with the face of a man. And the fourth living creature like an eagle in flight. And the four living creatures, each of them with six wings, are full of eyes all around and within. And day and night, they never cease to say, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. And whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who is seated on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who is seated on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever. They cast their crowns before the throne saying, worthy are you, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power for all you created and by your will they existed and were created. I, I, I uh, suppose that probably all of us in here have had the experience of trying to put into words um, an, an experience that we somehow were not able to capture with just a normal vocabulary. The words just didn't quite cut it. Maybe it was some amazing view, you know, you saw um, on, on vacation or some, you know, spectacular dunk you saw on Sports Center or some stunning jewelry you discovered uh, online or, 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 or maybe it was a particularly difficult calculus test. But uh, you wanted to put it into words, uh, but words just couldn't capture what you wanted to actually express. Um, we had an ex uh, experience like this back earlier in the year. Maggie and I had dinner at this restaurant and the waiter came out at the end of the meal said, uh, you, we've got a special dessert. Our chef wants to have you taste this dessert. And, uh, and he just raved about it. It was going to be really amazing. So he gave us this little kind of bottle of it. And, um, and Maggie didn't want to have any. So I, I took a, a taste of it and it was just, it was 
awful, just, just awful. And, uh, and, and so when the waiter left the table, I said to her, this is the worst thing I've ever tasted in my life. And she goes, well, what, what do you mean? What does it taste like? And, and I, I tried to put it into words, and, and I, this is almost a verbatim description. I said, well, and I mean, I thought about it. I said, I guess the best way to describe it is it tastes a little bit like the smell of a really, really clean men's restroom. Uh, I mean, you know, giving the guy some credit, it was clean, uh, but, uh, you know, kind of a sort of peppermint tidy bowl, and, and uh, it just, uh, it, words just couldn't do it justice, you know? That, that, I think, is the problem we face when we read these words by John, the son of Zebedee, who is the author of the book of Revelation, because first of all, we've got all this weird stuff going on, right? I mean, verse six, you've got the four living creatures, that kind of sounds like a rock band, and, uh, you know, at the Civic Center, the four living. And, and then uh, verse 7, uh, we got this one creature is like a lion, another's like an ox, third guy's got the face of a man, fourth is like an eagle in flight. You go, okay, that, that sounds like, you know, maybe something from Marvel Comics. And then verse 10, read about the mysterious gathering, 24 elders, which is an obvious reference to the offensive and defensive units of the Philadelphia Eagles. Uh, I, I, I say, uh, it's especially appropriate that they fell down. But, uh, but uh, I, I do, I do, I, I like the way one commentator uh, puts it. Uh, he put it like this. He said, in the book of Revelations, God uses the indescribable to point us to the undeniable. God uses the indescribable to point us to the undeniable. It's a reminder, I think, a good one. That with this book of Revelation in particular, our goal, our task is not to try to nail down every possible interpretation of the 24 elders or the six winged creatures or the, you know, seven horned sheep. Our task is to listen to the text, to to try to get a sense of what God was saying uh, to those believers for whom it was originally written back in the first century church, and then consider what does it say to us on this, on this first day of a new year, which is, which is kind of intriguing because if you go back to the first verse of Revelation chapter four, you'll read that a voice is speaking with the clarity and authority of a trumpet saying, look at the text, come up here and I will show you what must take place after this. Come up here and I will show you what must take place after this. Some translations literally render this phrase, I will show you what comes next. And it's in these words this morning that I want us to begin to hear two very basic and undeniable truths um, on the very first day of 2017. The the first of those truths, the first of those undeniable truths is, is simply this. The key to living an abundant life in this coming year, what, what, what Jesus describes in John chapter 10, verse 10, is, a, is living life to the fullest. It's the life for which you and I were created. It's the life that, that every one of us in this room and every person watching online and every person in the woodlands and everybody outside of those spaces, it's what all of us yearn for and desire. The key to living an abundant life in the coming year is not about what, it's about who. It's about who. It's not a question of what's to come, but an undeniable affirmation of the one who came. I think, um, I think most of us would agree this morning that, uh, that this has been an odd year and that the year to come uh, looks to be equally uh, odd, a year of uncertainty. There, uh, I think most of us would probably agree that the, the Christmas story that we celebrated o- only a week ago seems kind of uh, undersized and quaint in the face of the questions that, that we confront. Uh, the headlines we've read over the last month and even in the last 24 hours are anything but good tidings of great joy. Uh, less than 400 miles from uh, Jesus' birthplace, uh, the city of Bethlehem, uh, in the town of Aleppo, all of us have been hearing about an ongoing refugee crisis of untold uh, proportions. Um, the, the, the brightness that lights up the Middle Eastern sky is far more likely to be a bomb than a star. I mean, it's just, there's very little peace on earth and goodwill among men. Just, just last week, I, I heard a CNN anchor um, wonder breathlessly uh, if we were on the verge of total collapse. 
Uh, that, as I recall, it was just before she cut away to a yogurt commercial. But, but I, I think most of us do kind of have this, this, this sense of kind of kind of creeping concern. Well, John, when he wrote these words in the book of Revelation, probably sometime around 81 to 96 AD, the questions facing the church were also very, very real. Persecution under the Roman emperor Domitian had become ruthless and widespread. We know from historical accounts uh, of that day that Christians who refused to acknowledge Domitian as almighty Lord and God, as he demanded, were systematically killed. The historian Tacitus uh, describes Christians as being burned alive uh, to light up the emperor's grounds at night for games. Uh, other uh, believers uh, were, were, were sacrificed by tying them together, arms and legs to wild horses, uh, and then ripping them apart as the horses uh, galloped in opposite directions. Still others were covered in the hides of, of beasts and torn to death by dogs in the Colosseum. Um, and of course, we know from chapter one of the book of Revelations, verse nine, that John uh, himself uh, was not immune from, these, uh, from this crackdown. Uh, he was exiled and imprisoned at a penal colony on the island of Patmos, uh, a small uh, eight by four mile hunk of rock uh, among the, uh, the Deccanese Islands off the coast of, of Turkey. So, these were times of deep uncertainty, and understandably, in the midst of all this turmoil and increasing tension, there was one question on everybody's mind. What's next? What happens now? How, how's this thing going to play out? It's no wonder that uh, the voice calls out to John, verse 1, come up here, and I will show you. I will show you what must take place after this. But then there's an odd turn in the text, an odd turn, because uh, if you look at verse two, where we might have expected, you know, some sort of explanation of what must take place as we're promised in verse one, what we get instead in verse two is this statement. Look at the text, verse two, immediately I was in the spirit and behold, a throne was standing in heaven and one sitting on earth. The throne. Immediately I was in the spirit and behold, a throne was standing in heaven and one sitting on the throne. There's no mention whatsoever of what must take place. There's no re reference at all to what will come next. No step-by-step -step instructions about how it's all going to turn out. No clarity about what is to come. What we get instead is, is this assurance in verse two that one is seated Upon the throne, I was in the spirit, John writes, and behold, a throne was standing in heaven and one sitting on the throne. Now, John is clearly struck by this throne, this vision of the throne. He actually mentions it twice in just this one verse, verse two. Uh, in, in fact, if you actually go through the book of Revelation, uh, he actually refers to a throne 47 times. 47 times, to give you a sense of perspective, um, the, the, the book of the Bible with the next highest number of references to a throne is the Gospel of Matthew, in which a throne is mentioned four times. Four times. So, so clearly John is, is captured uh, by this, this, this vision. Uh, his imagination uh, is struck by this vision of the throne. And, and reading through the latter part of verse 6 into verse 9 of chapter 4, we begin to see that he's, he's taking great pains to help us understand that this is no normal throne. This is the throne of the Lord himself. Uh, look, look just, uh, for example, at verse 8. Verse 8. The four living creatures, each of them with six wings, are full of eyes all around and within, and day and night they never cease to say, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Now let's, let's stop there for just a minute and ask this question. Why is this a big deal? Why does this matter to us uh, on New Year's Day 2017? This is a big deal. This is a big deal because John understood the power of this image of the throne. He would have fully recognized that this title, Lord God Almighty, 
was precisely the title claimed by the Caesars. And, and, and he wouldn't have missed the significance of the one, the one seated on the throne. The clear affirmation that, that God shares his throne and his kingship with no one. And he would have been fixed on this image because with this image of the throne, God is essentially saying, look, I get it. I understand the pressure. I, 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 I see the, the dangers and the issues that you're struggling with, but don't get so focused on what comes next that you forget who has already come, who was, who is, and who is to come. I mean, all of us are curious about what this next year holds. All of us are, are, are curious about where we will go in the year 2000. We all like to know what's coming up. But Revelation 4 reminds us that the key to facing a new year is not about knowing what's coming up, but about remembering who came down. The, the Lord, who was, who is, and who is to come. Now, what does that mean for you and for me? This morning, I'm a, let's say I'm a, I'm a high school student, I'm a college student, I'm a, I'm a mom, I'm a dad, I'm a grandparent, I'm, I'm a single person living alone. What, what does this have to do with, with me? What does it mean? Well, it means simply this. Your joy and confidence and peace in this new year should not be, must, must not be anchored in what will take place. There, there aren't any guarantees. There aren't any guarantees about what might take place. Our joy and our confidence and peace in the new year must be anchored in the hope of the one who presides over what will take place. The, the one, notice it, not the two, not the three, but the one who is seated upon the throne. I, I think you would agree. We live in a, we live in a world, don't we, that, uh, that tells us all our answers can be found in the what questions, right? Like, like, like if we just knew what's next, if I could just get what uh, I want, then, then, then we could really survive and, and thrive and have an awesome year. If, if you're visiting Faith Bridge this morning or you're joining us online, or you're there at the Woodlands and you're worshiping with us um, and, and you're not really clear, well, what is it? What do these people mean when they talk about becoming a Christian or being a Christian? Well, Here's what it means, at least in part. What it means to be a Christian is to recognize on this New Year's morning that there is no what big enough, exciting enough, awesome enough, hip enough, cool enough, sexy enough, you name it. There's no what high enough to sustain us into the what comes next of this new year. We are creatures made in the image of God. We are created with a craving for God. And at the end of the day, uh, and, and the beginning of the year, uh, our hope is in a who and not in a what. Jesus, Jesus put it this way, John chapter 16, verse 33. He said, you know what? You're gonna have trouble in the world. You are gonna have questions. You are gonna have, this is not never, never land. But he said this, be of good cheer. Because I have overcome, I have overcome the world. I don't know. I don't know what your challenges are this morning. What sort of um, tyrants uh, are demanding your allegiance and, and stealing your sense of security, whether it's work or finances or, or, or physical problems or family concerns or addictions or, or hassles at school. Here's what I do know. The promise of this coming year is not in what will take place. It is in who will preside over what will take place. Now, that, that vision may be indescribable, but that truth is undeniable. But that leads us, that points us to a second truth that I want us to hear this morning uh, on this New Year's Sunday, and, and it's simply this. Um, the key to living life abundantly in the coming year will ultimately be determined not by how other people respond to us, but by how, how we respond to Jesus. Not by how other people respond to us, by how we respond to Jesus. Um, I hope you'll forgive me if I tell a story that I uh, told here uh, five or six years ago in Faith Bridge. Um, back when I was in seminary at Gordon-Conwell up in Boston, we were involved in a little Bible study, my wife and myself and another couple, and there are three couples in all, and uh, one of the couples was uh, Mike and Gail Ford. And what was intriguing about this is that Mike Ford's dad, Gerald, at the time, happened to be president of the United States. 
And, uh, and so uh, when it was finally time for us to graduate, um, the seminary actually invited President Ford to come up and speak at uh, commencement. I, I guess like my dad was busy. And, and, uh, and, and so uh, anyway, they, uh, they, they, this is going to be great. Uh, President and Mrs. Ford are going to come up on Air Force One. Well, Mike thought it would be really cool if, uh, if the president, uh, if his dad got a chance to meet some of his buddies. And so he said to me one day, he said, uh, he said Duffy, uh, when my dad comes up for commencement, uh, we were thinking while he's here, we could have a little picnic. Uh, and we'd love to have you guys come. Is that something you, you, know, you, you and Maggie would be interested in? And I'm going, you know, are you kidding? I mean, what an opportunity this would be for the president. And, and so I said, uh, I said, we definitely want to do that. And, and so uh, we said, okay. And so we set the you know, plans and everything. But there was a little bit of discussion um, among my friends about, well, okay, that's great. But what do you say when you meet the president? Like, what's the right protocol? You know, because somehow you're just like, dude, you know, that doesn't, uh, doesn't work. And if you do a chest bump, you might get shot. And so, and, and so uh, we sort of thought about that a little bit. Well, anyway, the big day came. And, um, and, and this is a true story. The, the picnic was actually at the home of General George Patton. Now, he was dead. He didn't know we were there. But, uh, but uh, it was actually at the Patton's house. And, and so we're just having, I mean, if you just kind of walked in and looked at it from a distance, it just looked like a normal picnic, right? Just hot dogs and hamburgers and lemonade and, and guys uh, with machine guns. And, and I remember kind of waiting for just the right moment, you know, to, to, to greet the president. And I had a little something prepared. Uh, but everything just, just went, just, just fell apart because what happened was I'd gone back inside the Patton's house to get my wife and my own glass of lemonade refilled. And as I come back out the screen porch, who should open the screen door but Gerald Ford, president of the United States. And this is not what I've planned. And I've got lemonade in both hands and I can't, you know, toss it. And, you know, and, 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 and could you hold that lemonade, Mr. President? Oh, sorry about that stain, sir. You know, and, uh, and so what I did was under pressure, I choked. I just choked. I actually did a curtsy. <laughs> you know what? You're laughing, but he kissed my hand. That, that's not true. That's not true. Um, you know what? I am, I am pretty sure that is not the proper way to meet a president. That is probably not the proper way to greet a president. But, but, but what I want us to understand is there's a scene here in the throne room of Revelation chapter 4 where we're given a picture of the perfect way to greet and respond to the Lord God Almighty. Let's look at verse 9. Whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who is seated on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who is seated on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever. They cast their crowns before the throne saying, worthy are you, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and by your will they existed and were created. Now, did you catch that image in verse 10? 24 elders fell down before the throne of God. Now, uh, first of all, who are these, who are these 24 elders? Uh, we've actually uh, already seen them mentioned in Verse 4 of Revelation chapter 4, they uh, gather around the throne of God. They're seated on lesser thrones of their own, clad in, in white garments, the scripture says, with golden crowns upon their heads. That much we know. Uh, but that, there's a lot that we still don't know. And, and, and one of the observations you begin to make as you study the book of Revelations and as you begin to read the commentaries is, um, is there's sort of this sport where people love to kind of come up with fantastic theories about, about what this symbolizes and who this uh, represents. I, I, um, I, I think there's kind of this default temptation to try to nail everything down really tight. I came across one commentary uh, where the, the scholar tried to sort of uh, identify the 144,000 faithful uh, that are mentioned in Revelation chapter 7, uh, verse 4, as uh, a symbol for the whole church of, of Christ. And, and the way he arrived at this interpretation is that 
according to scripture, he said, three is God's number, right? Trinity. Uh, four stands for creation. And, and so if you do three times four, that equals 12, which equals the whole church. And since 10 means completeness, then 10 cubed means three dimensional completeness. And obviously 12 squared times 10 cubed equals 144,000, which equals the church in all it's going to. Now, please forgive me. I don't want to be cynical, but to me, this sounds like a, a guy that flunked calculus. But, but uh, the, in, is, in fact, the number 24 um, is, is mentioned really only here in the book of Revelation, and it's not generally recognized as, as a number of particular uh, significance. But the number 12, the number 12 is a little different because when you hear the number 12, uh, well, let me just ask you, when you think of the Old Testament and you hear the number 12, what do you think of? All right, the 12 tribes of Israel. When you think of the New Testament, you think of the number 12, what do you think of? The 12 disciples. So, so, so commentators have, have begun to wonder if maybe that's what this is a symbol, this points us to, is, is the saints of God in the Old Testament and the New Testament. Saints who are cleansed, hence the, the white robes, uh, and, and who are crowned, they are priests, we're a kingdom of priests, and they're worshiping at the feet of the Lord. I don't know for sure, but here's what I do know. Here's what's very clear. Whoever they are, and this is, this is what we must not miss, here's the undeniable truth. Whoever they are, their response to the Lord is spot on, because what they did in response to the reigning Lord was worship. Worship. Now, now you know, I don't know what you think of when you hear the word worship. One of the, it's one of those words that people hear different stuff. Sometimes people think of uh, coming and, and, and organs and, and coats and ties. And, you know, I, I remember as a boy when I thought about worship, we were going to go to church. Uh, we went to a big, huge kind of Gothic structure that had massive chandeliers uh, inside. When I thought of worship, uh, I imagined myself sitting there in the balcony counting the lights and then calculating who would they hit if they fell. Uh, and, and then uh, me and my brother would sort of test the power of prayer. You know, uh, bombs away on the middle. And, uh, and, uh, and that's kind of what I thought of. And, 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 and maybe if you're sort of uh, joining us by live stream or you're visiting here this morning, this is kind of a new deal going to church. That's what you think of. The church is kind of like, you know, jury duty, but not as fun. Uh, it, it, it just sort of has this bad, bad vibe. Uh, what we need to recognize, first of all, that, that, that worship, worship comes from an old English word, worth Ship. Worship. It, it literally means worthy. Worthy. So when we worship God, we're, we're saying, Lord, you're worthy. You're worthy of our time. You're worthy uh, of our, our song. You're worthy of our praise. You're, you're worthy of our gifts, our attention. But most of all, when we talk about worship, when we talk about, Lord, you are worthy, Paul reminds us, the Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 12, that we're talking about giving ourselves to God as a living sacrifice. Everything I am, everything I have, Lord, it's yours because you are worthy. There's no better image of worship than the one we see right here in verse 10. The 24 elders fall down before the Lord who is seated on the throne, and they cast their crowns before him. It is a great image because these 24 elders, first of all, they fell down before God. And, 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 and talk about an undeniable truth. You, it's really, really hard to worship God when you are still on your own throne. You cannot fall down unless you leave your throne. You see, worship is about falling before God in surrenders, giving all claims to ourselves, uh, to him, giving up all our own little kingdom schemes. It's about casting our crown before him. My tendency as a sinner is to be king in my own little kingdom, but I cast my crown before the one who is seated on the throne. That's the kind of passion that ignites the fire in verse 11 when the elders sing, worthy are you our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power for you created all things and by your will they will exist and were created. Now you might be thinking, well, Duffy, 
That sounds kind of exhilarating, but, <clears throat> but uh, can't I just enjoy the music and the ritual and the community without, you know, having to cast my crown before him? Yeah, you, you can. You can. Just like you can eat Chinese food with one chopstick uh, and, and play piano with your mittens uh, on and, and uh, you know, skateboard without wheels. You, you can do that. But singing without the surrender is, is dead. It's, it's empty. It's lifeless. In fact, I'm just going to ask you this morning, uh, if uh, this very first day of 2017, it's a good question to consider. Have you left your throne? Have you left your throne to fall before the one who is the Lord God Almighty? Have you cast your crown at his feet? Said, Lord, you're, you're worthy. You're worthy of my attention. You're worthy of my career decisions. You're worthy of my friendship choices. You're worthy of my entertainment options. And, and, and here's why I ask. You see, John fully understood that he was sharing this vision in the book of Revelation with people who were under intense pressure to cave into the culture around them, to, you know, moderate a bit, to maybe just uh, give a little nod to the emperor, to recognize that times were changing and that the culture could be very, very unkind to those who wound up on the wrong side of history. And it's a pressure that every single one of us faces every day. And the key to living abundant life in this coming year is ultimately going to be determined not by other people's response to us, but by our individual willingness to respond to Jesus by falling before him. John reminds us in Revelation chapter 4 that what comes before, what comes next, is falling before the Lord in worship and surrender. I don't know what your story is this first morning of New Year's Day, but here's what I do know. That we face a lot of questions, a lot of difficulties, lots of issues, some possible opposition, and also some grand adventures. But at the heart of it is a who who is seated on the throne, one who is the Lord God Almighty. And the most powerful prayer the most amazing resolution, revolution, the most unbelievable prayer we could pray this day would be the prayer that those elders prayed at the very, very end of this chapter when they said, holy, holy, holy are you, Lord God Almighty. I yield my throne to you. I cast my crown before you at your feet. I worship you because you are worthy my Lord, my God, to receive glory and honor and power and me. Let's pray. In this quiet, in just a moment, I'm gonna ask you, I'm gonna consider, get, and get, invite you to think about this possibility. What would it look like for you to cast down your crown, to step away from your throne, and say, Lord, I, I fall before you. I pray, Lord, that as we, as we look ahead into this new year with all of its possibilities and all of its questions, I pray, Lord, that you would help us to recognize that in the midst of it all, it is you who are on the throne. Help us not get so fixated by the what's that we forget the power of that holy, mighty who. In the midst of it all, I pray that you would help us to live lives of worship living sacrifice, fall before you, casting down our crowns. Thank you, Lord, that in this act, we not only give you the glory, but we gain the possibility of living with you the life for which we were created, which is the most amazing new year, new life of all. We pray this, Lord, in the strong name of Jesus. And everybody said, amen. Welcome to Postscript. Here we hope to answer your questions and help you dig deeper into the messages and sermons at FaithBridge by talking with the teacher of the day.
Welcome to Postscript. My name is Michael Sullivan, Business Administrator here at FaithBridge, and I'm joined by Duffy Robbins, who just brought us the first sermon of 2017, uh, and it was a great one. Thank Thanks, you, sir. Duffy. Appreciate that. Uh, you gave us really two points to look at as we kind of think about what's next, uh, which is really on everybody's mind, rolling yeah, into yeah, a new yeah, year. New school year, new, I mean, new uh, year, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and so the first thing you talked to us about is it's not necessarily about the what, it's about the who. Yeah. Uh, and that is important, but I was sitting thinking, you know, there's probably a lot of people out there who their what just feels so big right now. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, could be um, with the new president coming in and just uncertainty there, just uncertainty in the world, as you pointed out, uh, in Aleppo. Um, there's uncertainty maybe with a job or with their family. So when these what's feel so big, how do you then practically get your attention focused on the who? Yeah, great question. Totally legit question. Um, and, and, you know, to be fair, uh, I think, first of all, I got to recognize that the people to whom this vision was given, mm -hmm. um, their what was, was, pretty darn heavy as well. I mean, they were, as I said this morning, I mean, they were facing unbelievable uh, persecution. And uh, and so for them to just, it, it, you, one has to be really careful about it, just being really flippant. It's not about what, you know. Mm -hmm. it, that I think all of us understand at one level that's true, mm -hmm. but right now, you know, my wife has cancer. Right mm -hmm. now, I can't find a job. Right now, my, my son is just going crazy. And mm -hmm. those what's seem really, really big. And I don't think there's anything in Scripture that suggests that God doesn't want us to take seriously those what's. In other words, we're not, we're not living in Never Never Land. We have to pay attention to those issues. Mm -hmm. but, uh, but, just to, but, so, but part of it is saying let's remember th that the key in all this, and this is where these guys, uh, John was, I think, trying to kind of encourage them, is remember mm -hmm. there's one who's on the throne, and it's not a Caesar. Yeah. It's not Domitian. And, uh, and that that's where I have to trust, for example, Jeremiah 29, God says, I know the plans I have for you mm -hmm. and, and the goodness of God. Because uh, otherwise, it, it will just drive us crazy. Now, in practical terms, mm -hmm. how do I deal with that? I think, uh, first of all, recognize the power and the legitimacy of lament. Mm -hmm. in, in the Psalms, uh, we have psalms of lament. We have in the book of uh, uh, in the Bible a book of lamentations, mm -hmm. where uh, you know the people of God are lamenting the situation in which they find themselves. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, there's nothing unspiritual or unfaithful or bad about lament. Mm -hmm. um, even in uh, even in Jesus's own life, we see lament reflected mm -hmm. uh, on the cross when he. You know, uh, cited these words from Psalm 22, my God, my God, why hast thou forsake me? So that's the first thing. Mm -hmm. because I, And I mention that because some people go, oh, well, you're just, you know, you're fixated on the what. It's about the who. Mm -hmm. And and we can we can really hurt our brothers and sisters in Christ mm -hmm. by sort of diminishing their struggle, diminishing their what, yeah. by saying, well, come on, snap out of it. Yeah. You know, focus on the who. Secondly, I think uh, as in, term, uh, in addition to lament and, and practicing lament, um, community is, is critical. Mm -hmm. uh, when, when we feel that we are carrying huge burdens, uh, we do what we do anytime we're trying to carry something that's heavy and too big and too cumbersome. We say, hey, can you guys help me with this? Mm -hmm. And uh, the problem is, you know, we tend to go the other direction. We sort of shrink. We sort of get into our hole. We want to kind of, no, I'll, 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 when I get better, then I'll kind of get out there. Mm -hmm. That's one of the, the essential and wonderful ministries of a church mm -hmm. is that this is a place where we can bear one another's burdens, we can hurt together. Uh, to use Paul's you know, metaphor of the body, uh, if one part of the body hurts, we all suffer. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that's another thing is to make sure just on practical terms that we are involved. Mm -hmm. Doesn't have to be everybody. You don't have to stand up and share this on Sunday morning, but there needs to be a, a group, a community of people that can help you carry that load. You wouldn't try to walk around and carry a piano by yourself mm -hmm. 
it, you can't carry some of these what's by yourself. They're too big, too cumbersome mm-hmm. uh, to do that on your own. And then I think thirdly is, and I'll, and I'll just do this, there is, comes out of James first chapter is that what God seems to say to us in the midst of our what's and our trials is that, um, that they can be used as a way of bringing us to our knees or to our feet as they were in Revelation chapter four, mm-hmm. um, that we, come, we actually ask God to use them uh, as a, a way to deepen, to excavate places in our heart that have not yet been given to him because mm-hmm. we didn't need him, you know? Yeah. Uh, C.S. Lewis in The Problem of Pain talks about this, this whole idea that there's something about trial that deepens us. Mm-hmm. I'll, I will, um, I'll recommend a book, um, and it's interesting because it's a book that talks about uh, kingship, and that's one of the main themes in Revelation 4. It's a book by a guy named uh, Gene Edwards, G-E-N-E, Edwards, called The Tale of Three Kings. Mm-hmm. And uh, it's a study, the subtitle is A Study in Brokenness. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and I would recommend to, uh, to people, I do recommend to people who are going through uh, you know, hard, hard what's, I'd say. It's a, it's a very small book. It's a short little book, too. Um, but uh, it, it's a study of the life of David and, and uh, you know, his situation of trying to live between Absalom and Saul. Mm. Uh, some of the people you're talking about with hard what's, they have either uh, a Saul for whom they're working mm-hmm. or an Absalom with whom they're loving and living. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and those are some of the most painful what's of all. So I would... I would recommend uh, that that might be uh, sort of a way, a a tool that God could use to deepen Mm -hmm. our longing for him, our our sensitize our need for him. That's the third way to say, God, deepen in me. St. John of the Cross, his book, Dark Night of the Soul, um, is sort of a meditation on that. And and, uh, I think think that's that's the third way that God can use those what's. We can use those what's practically. Mm -hmm. Uh, what do we do with them? We don't. We don't just stuff them and say, "Oh no!" If you really are focused on who you want to ask that, mm-hmm. no, you will ask that. Mm-hmm. You should ask that. God's yeah. not afraid of that. In James, you know, he says, "If any of you lacks wisdom, ask God." Mm-hmm. But without doubting, because the person that doubts is like a, a double-minded person; they mm-hmm. unstable in all their ways. But uh, so I think that's that's kind of what we're to do with those what's. Yeah, I think that's really helpful because I think sometimes the natural inclination is to just try and brush past it. I don't need to, to sit yeah. in this. I'm just gonna, you know, muscle up and do this myself. Yeah. And or there, like you said, there is a time and a season for everything. There is a time yeah. to lament and then to really have people around you who can help. Uh, and then, like you said, just pressing into the Lord and trusting that he's gonna use this season for his good and his glory. Yeah, uh, I think that's really good. Well, the second part of your sermon, you really talked about uh, in this season, it's not necessarily about how you respond to others, but it's about how you respond to Jesus. And you were kind of talking about, hey, in this time that John was writing, it was, it was a difficult season for them. And there was some persecution going on. And, and many Christians today would probably say, hey, that's how I'm feeling right now. Uh, yeah. You know, I am a social outcast at school or at work because of the beliefs that I have. Uh, they're viewed as old school or that's you know dumb or you're weak or, or whatever the case. And, and sometimes that costs you maybe a promotion or uh, it costs you fitting in or, or whatever the case may be. But there's probably some people who feel this tension right now. And it's even greater, obviously, in, in other countries, but yeah. even in the U.S. and our culture as well. So maybe can you speak to that? How do, how do you... How do you deal with this uh, tough culture right now? Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. And this is, that's precisely why I wanted to sort of raise that point that, um, and I don't mean necessarily how we respond to others. What I'm saying is how do others respond to us is not as important as how we respond to Jesus. How we respond to others is critically important. Sure. But, but a lot of times um, we excuse that. We excuse our response. We excuse our behavior because we say, "Well, look at the way these guys are treating me. Look at what they're doing." You know, I mean, they're they're in they're they're bashing uh, you know my candidate or bashing my beliefs or, and uh, and I and those again that those uh, 
those those hurts or those insults. I'm not saying that they're all that that all those accusations and assaults are legit. They're not a lot of them. Sure. What I'm saying at the end of the day, it's not how they respond to us. It's it's going to be how we respond to Jesus in the midst of that stuff. Sure. Uh, it, ultimately, he's the one on the throne, and it is to him to whom we must give account. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think so. Practically speaking, if I, I mean, and I feel that way as much as the next guy. You know, mm-hmm. I think uh, the first thing I have to do. Just practically speaking, mm-hmm. be very, very cautious about social media. Mm-hmm. Now, I'm I'm talking to myself here, but I know I have a my default uh, in, in, instinct is I, I've I've gotten better about uh, curbing it. But my default instinct, as soon as I see something on Twitter or you know Facebook, mm-hmm. or, is I want to put some sort of snarky comment mm-hmm. on there. And uh, and this just happened this week where a guy, you know. Uh, criticized something, and I and I wanted so badly to, to to say something, but but I didn't. It wouldn't really have been engagement. It would really have been just kind of uh, you know striking back. Mm. It's not like hey, let's try to let's try to reconcile. It's mm. more like I want to I want to just make this guy look stupid. Yeah, one of them. Yeah, and, and and so that would be the just from a practical standpoint. And for some of you, that might, you know what? Get rid of your Twitter account. Get rid of your, you know, (laughs) don't ever try to embrace discussion on Facebook. It's not a forum that really is suited to that. Mm -hmm. It's a forum that's suited to snarky comments. Mm -hmm. And and so, and this is where I think Christians have really hurt ourselves. We don't have to respond to every single uh, time we feel, you know, slighted and and shoved Mm -hmm. um you know you again we go think about jesus you know who was like a lamb led to the slaughter and though reviled he reviled not and i think as hard as that is Mm -hmm. and it's hard that's the model you know for us i think that's that's one thing is to is to really do an inventory a stupidity inventory (laughs) of your social media Mm -hmm. uh you know relationships and interactions Uh, i think secondly is uh you know, try to make, uh, as a rule, try to make it more a question of, uh, of, of gesture than posture. Uh, Andy Crouch, uh, who is uh, the author of <clears throat> a number, two or three really awesome books. The first one uh, was Culture Making by University Press. Um, but Andy makes the point that uh, we've sort of confused in the evangelical community the difference between gestures and postures. Mm-hmm. Postures are are, you know, what we have right now, we're, a, we're in a sitting posture mm-hmm. and somebody, the guy that's running the camera is in a standing posture. Mm-hmm. And, you know, the thing about postures is um, they tend to be the same. Gestures, on the other hand, can, uh, can change to fit the situation. Mm-hmm. We get stuck in a posture. And so when, when, you know, we have a position on something, we just kind of default to this posture, we're against it, we're angry, we're whatever. There are times when gestures of, of, in, uh, of engagement and even rebuttal are totally appropriate. I mean, we have as much right to, to share ideas as the next person. But uh, the problem is we tend to default to a posture where we're always angry, always upset, here they go again. Mm-hmm. Instead of saying, no, wait, this is, a, this is a posture. I don't need to remain in this posture. I can use these gestures if and when they are appropriate to me. And I think uh, part of it is sort of looking at my life and maybe even asking people who know me and people mm-hmm. who spend time with me, so, you know, what, what is my posture? Mm-hmm. What is my posture? Uh, because maybe I've defaulted to these attitudes or these ways of being. And, and, uh, and then I discredit the very ideas that I hope to champion. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, and then I guess uh, thirdly is to recognize, and I think this is really, really important, uh, the robust reality of sin. Because if you don't have a robust sense of the power and the nature of sin, you're going to be disappointed when people are sinful. Mm-hmm. And they will be, mm-hmm. a lot. And when I say they, I mean you and me. Yeah, sure. And And so, you know, part of this, I think, understanding the robust uh, the depth and the breadth of the sin problem begins with a humble look at our own lives, mm-hmm. recognize that, you know what, I, 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 I've said stupid stuff even now, and how many stupid things did I say before I knew Jesus? Mm-hmm. 
you know, part of this is, is just the problem of sin. This is why I need to love. This is why I need to try to reconcile. This is why I can't afford to break off the relationship. These people, they're lost. And uh, if, if we only hang out with people who agree with us, then nobody else is ever going to get found. Mm -hmm. And so coming to terms with the depth and the problem of sin helps us to recognize, first of all, that we need to extend grace to those who are, who are assaulting us. Mm -hmm. But secondly, that those people need, as we did and as we still do, they need to be, we need, they need to be rescued. They need to be saved by grace. So I think it's trying to cultivate that recognition. Uh, otherwise, we're going to walk around really angry and disheartened and discouraged and disappointed. That's especially so in the church, I, I would say. I always tell my students, if you don't have a good, robust doctrine of sin and you try to live in a community of Christians, you're going to be upset a lot. Yeah. But it's certainly true in the broader level as well. As soon as we start to engage, you know, we're going to have that. And I'll just mention one more, and that is, I think, recognize the value of engaging with people who have different ideas uh, because because maybe we're wrong, you know, maybe on certain issues or maybe we need to rethink or maybe our position needs to be nuanced mm -hmm. in some way. Um, I don't like that. Mm -hmm. I'm not great at that. But I do think uh, that, that uh, I'm reading a book right now um, that's uh, by a woman named DeFrance. I think it's called DeFrance, Megan DeFrance, called Sex Difference in Christian Theology. And uh, and it's about you know a lot of these gender questions, a big fat book. And uh, but uh, there's there's quite a bit she says with which I have deep disagreement. But it's also it's also kind of challenging me to think and rethink mm -hmm. and sharpen my own position. So mm -hmm. I think you know at the end of the day, there's also a great value in just listening to mm -hmm. those, even the ones who who are kind of we feel we're being attacked by. Yeah. Because I think, you know, you were talking about social media, and I think a lot of times when we're on social media, the reason we have a posture and not a gesture is because yeah. you don't see that it's a real person with real right. feelings, That's right? right? And it. so sometimes... And how much can you really, how much can you engage with a hundred and whatever it is, 46 characters, you right. know? Or, or just on Facebook, it's just, mm -hmm. you just, it's not... You know, it's not really a forum for engagement. We've, we've kind of, we sort of let the forum shape our engagement mm -hmm. instead of saying, no, wait a minute. You know, this is not, this is not the way people have engaged in generations before. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's a new ball game. Yeah. Well, thank you, Duffy, for being here today. Thank yeah. you for helping us look into 2017. And thank you for joining us on Postscript. We'll be back next week as we kick off our Resolve for More series. We'll see you next week. Thanks for joining us for Postscript. Help us keep the podcast interactive by submitting your questions during the morning services. Learn more at faithbridge.org postscript.